Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This will be an update, so to speak, on my talk from 2013 on bradyarrhythmias. Now, as you can probably imagine, not a whole lot has changed as far as bradyarrhythmias go. Um, it's really the same as it's always been. I mean, it's an EKG, right? Uh, but apparently, at some point in the last few years, some of my lectures have lost audio, and I don't know how that happened because when I initially uploaded them, they had audio, otherwise I wouldn't upload them. Uh, but I've been in contact with YouTube and trying to get these videos fixed, and they really haven't been too helpful. So I'm just going to re-record these videos, but I'm in the middle of an MPH program, so it's going to take me some time to go through and find these videos and re-record them. Uh, so please have patience. In the meantime, if you do come across any of my videos where there's no sound, you can turn the closed caption feature on and it will actually show you what I'm saying. So I don't know what's going on with that, um, but hopefully we can get this resolved. So Brady Arrhythmia is here. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a real long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, how to formulate differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that will come in handy for you as you gear up to study for uh, the later steps of the USMLE Step 2 and Step 3, and particularly Step 3 where it's not really a multiple choice test when you get to those clinical case scenarios and for real life because, as you know, patients don't come in with multiple choices stamped on their heads. Wouldn't it be nice if they did, though? So we're going to talk about Brady arrhythmias here. Apparently the rest of my videos do have sound, so I'm not going to be updating them anytime soon. They are uh, pretty accurate to now. Like I said, not, none of this stuff has really changed. So Brady arrhythmias I'm going to talk about now. I also have videos on tachyarrhythmias, flutters and fibrillations, and premature contractions and pre-excitations. So what is Brady arrhythmia? Well, Brady means slow. It comes from Greek. Uh, it means slow. And uh, arrhythmia just means an abnormal rhythm. So what do we, uh, what, how do we define a slow heart rate? Well, we define a normal heart rate as between 60 and 100. So anything less than 60 we consider to be slow. Does that mean it's abnormal? No. Uh, there are some people with a naturally slow heart rate. People whose hearts are very strong, that can contract a lot of blood out, their hearts don't need to beat as fast. Who are those people? Those are going to be your endurance athletes, marathon runners. Their hearts are nice and strong, and they beat more blood out with, with each beat. So they don't need to beat as fast. So if you have a marathon runner coming in, and they've got a heart rate, a resting heart rate of 52 beats per minute, that's totally normal. Now, if you have a little old lady coming in with a heart rate, resting heart rate of, of 50 beats per minute, that might be something that you want to take a look at. So the most important factor to note is whether the patient is stable. And by stable, we mean how is their blood pressure? Is their blood pressure low? Uh, if it's not low, then you're okay. Blood pressure is perfusion uh, for, for all intents and purposes. Also, is there chest pain present? Some of these arrhythmias are associated with coronary artery disease. So if they have ischemia, they're probably going to have angina. Uh, has there been or was there loss of consciousness? So this can be anything from, uh, from dizziness to actual falls. And is there paleness, cold extremities, or sequelae from fall? Uh, this is just lack of perfusion. So really what we're looking at is low blood pressure and lack of perfusion. Any patient who's experiencing acute symptoms should receive therapy. And we're going to talk about those two therapies. That's primarily atropine and pacing. And that pacing can be either external, which is typically done for emergency circumstances. Uh, what we do is sort of a, a short-term treatment. And then internal pacing, which is a little bit... Uh, it's more long-term, but it's more difficult to place, and so that's something that we use for long-term treatment. But really, we only do treatment if the patient is acutely symptomatic. So we're going to talk about uh, a variety of different bradyarrhythmias, sinus bradycardia. We're going to talk about the 4AV nodal blocks that you'll see on the test, and then we'll talk about the bundle branch blocks. 
So sinus bradycardia is simply a heart rate of less than 60, but otherwise it's a totally normal EKG. Now you're going to need to get EKGs to diagnose any of these. A slow, a slow heartbeat can be any of these, uh, but uh, you need to get an EKG. Sinus bradycardia is just a heart rate of less than 60 with a normal EKG. The PR interval is not prolongated. Remember that a normal PR interval is anywhere between 0.12 and 0.2 seconds, which is going to be approximately the size or a little less than one big box. Also, every P wave is followed by a QRS complex, and the QRS complexes are normal in appearance. You don't have any dimples on the QRS complex, and we'll talk about that when we get to bundle branch blocks. So basically, it's just a normal EKG that's a little bit slow. And there are many causes of sinus bradycardia. So excessive vagal tone, carotid sinus pressure, hypothyroidism, adverse effects of opiates or benzodiazepines, hypothermia, seizures, ischemic heart disease, and acute MI. You can see some of these are, are, uh, are, are, are well, these are all abnormal. Uh, but some of these are obvious in why they cause uh, a, a, a low heart rate. So excessive vagal tone. Um, carotid sinus pressure kind of along the same lines. Uh, hypothermia is going to slow the heart down. Uh, ischemic heart disease and acute MI as we're going to talk about not so much causing bradycardia uh, but these ones are going to be really big uh, when when we get to uh, the AV blocks. So many causes of sinus bradycardia. The symptoms, if present, will be those typical features of hypoperfusion. So dizziness, syncope, disorientation, lightheadedness, hypotension when you get your, your, uh, your blood pressure. So sinus bradycardia can happen to virtually anyone. It's not always abnormal. If there are symptoms, uh, it's going to be things like lightheadedness, confusion, loss of consciousness, and dizziness. Physical exam, really all you're going to see is a heart rate less than 60 and hypotension, and that would be considered a symptom which would warrant treatment. They may appear distressed. Again, that's all uh, has to do with low perfusion. Loss of consciousness can happen as well. The diagnosis is going to be a low heart rate, and a person with low heart rate, especially if they have symptoms, that will indicate an EKG, and an EKG will show you sinus bradycardia. You're not gonna see anything abnormal other than the low heart rate. The treatment is to establish IV access and then administer IV atropine until there's resolution. If it's refractory, then you'll initiate transcutaneous pacing, and that would be our first step as far as pacing, but these patients are going to ultimately need a, uh, an internal pacing. And the reason is because transcutaneous pacing is very uncomfortable. You basically have something above, uh, on the skin that's, that's causing the heart to contract, it's very uncomfortable. So you'll ultimately want to establish internal pacing, but this is sort of our stopgap in the meantime. Now, like I said, not all patients with sinus bradycardia need treatment, so you need to use your clinical judgment here. So this is an example of sinus bradycardia, and one of the reasons that it's kind of nice I'm going over some of these videos is that you can see we're widescreen now, so I can make some of these images a little bit bigger. So this is sinus bradycardia. It often helps to look at this long strip on the bottom. You can see that we are uh, probably about, I don't know, 50 some beats per minute here, maybe a little bit slower. And uh, you can see that there's, uh, the P waves aren't very clear here, but you can see here's a P wave right here. And then here's your QRS complex. And it's roughly one big block. So one big block box. It's a little bit shorter, but not by much. Uh, so here's your, your P wave here where it ends, and then here's your QRS complex. It's almost exactly one big box. So this is sinus bradycardia. QRS complexes look normal. They're nice and you know pretty narrow. Uh, you don't have any widening. There's no dimple. So this all looks good. Here's another one here, and here's another one. So this is uh, quite slow. So 360, 180, 120, uh, 90, 60. So this is quite a slow heartbeat here. All right, now getting on to the AV nodal blocks, this is gonna be the bulk of what we're gonna talk about. 
This is a conduction disorder due to interruption between the SA node and the AV node. And the S between the SA node and the AV node, that's really your, uh, your, your PR interval. And so when you have a block there, it results in an elongation of the PR interval. So that's the end of the P wave all the way to the peak of your QRS complex, which is your R point. So that's, that's the distance that you're measuring. If it's more than one big block, it's considered prolonged. That's more than 0.2 seconds. It can be normal in some patients uh, insofar as it's, uh, as it's congenital. If it's acquired, the usual cause is ischemia. It can be post-MI feature or it com can come on due to a chronic coronary artery disease. The symptoms of present, again, typical features of hypoperfusion, dizziness, syncope, disorientation, lightheadedness, hypotension when you get your, your uh, blood pressure. So here's your conduction system. So you have your sinoatrial node here, SA node, and the sinoatrial node just sits between the, the superior vena cava and the right atrium, and it really controls the heart rate. It overrides the AV node. The AV node right here sits on the border of the, uh, the atria and the ventricles, and this has its own intrinsic firing rate. So if this, uh, if the if there's a disruption between the SA node and the AV node and it's going slower, the AV node can actually take over. The problem is the AV node's intrinsic firing rate is only about 40 to 60 beats per minute. So let's say you totally wipe out your SA node, your AV node would take over, but it would be 40 to 60 beats per minute. It would be very, very slow. And so uh, that's why you can see here that there is an association between disruption between the SA and AV node and bradycardia. And then uh, as we're going to see uh, when we get to bundle branch blocks, there's this uh, the left and right bundle branch, uh, which, which runs along the, uh, the ventricular septum, interventricular septum, and it conducts along the left and right side of the ventricles. And this is very important for ventricular uh, contraction. We're going to talk about four different kinds of AV nodal block first degree, two types of second degree, and third degree. And this is very high yield for USMLE. You'll want to know the difference between all four of these. And it's not tremendously difficult. You just need to memorize them. So an AV nodal block, in general, look for a history of coronary artery disease. Uh, a coronary artery disease is going to disrupt those cells between the SA and AV node. And that's why you see a lot of association between coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, for example, because it disrupts cells that uh, result in atrial contraction. So some of the symptoms uh, of first degree AV block, it can be congenital, so generally it doesn't have symptoms. Uh, with second degree AV blocks, they may or may not have symptoms of hypoperfusion, depending on how severe it is. But with the third degree blocks, they almost always have symptoms of hypoperfusion, particularly loss of consciousness, sporadic loss of consciousness. Physical exam, you'll hear an irregular rate and rhythm with some patients with second or third degree block, but with first degree AV block, your, their physical exam is gonna be normal. This is something that you only will discover when you get an EKG for some other reason. Diagnosis, so heart rate less than 60 along with symptoms of hypoperfusion should warrant an EKG, as we've already talked about. EKG findings for AV nodal block, it's gonna depend on the type. So here we go, we're gonna talk about these four types. So here is a first degree AV block, and really this is, you can't really tell just by this alone necessarily, but it looks fairly normal. Uh, all you have here is a, uh, you, you can tell just based on the, uh, uh, on how many big blocks. So look, 360, 180, 120, 90, uh, 60, and then what's 360 divided by uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so you're a little less than 60 beats per minute here. Uh, so this is technically bradycardia. But more importantly, here you can see from the end of your P wave, uh, to your uh, uh, your R, and I guess I drew this a little too far here, uh, but you can see here uh, is your, your R, and here is the end of your P wave. It is more than one big blo uh, block. So here's your P, uh, end of your P, and here's your R coming down here. Uh, so it's about seven little blocks, or uh, one point, I guess you could say like 1.3 uh, big blocks. 
blocks. You don't need to worry about converting those to seconds. You just need to know that if the if the PR interval is more than one big block, it's considered prolonged PR interval. Okay, so this is a first degree AV block. Everything else is totally normal. So you can see much uh, lower heart rate here. Uh, but what's most important is uh, the, uh, the the fact that you have regular uh, you have a regular rate, and then your uh, PR interval is prolonged. That's the only thing that's abnormal uh, here as far as uh, conduction goes. So here's another one here. Uh, and really this is not in the setting of bradycardia, uh, but you do have a prolonged PR interval. Now a prolonged PR interval by itself does not uh, d does not necessarily tell you that it's a first degree AV block. A first degree AV block is just an isolated prolonged PR interval. And you're not going to have any other abnormal findings that would lend itself to a diagnosis of some other AV block. Okay, now this is a second degree AV block, and second degree AV blocks come in two different flavors, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2, and they're very different, so you'll want to know the difference. So a second degree AV block, type 1, also known as Wenckebach, is a progressive PR elongation. So think of Mobitz type 1, second degree Mobitz type 1 with progressive PR elongation. So look at this PR uh, interval here. It's fairly normal. It's about one big block. And now this one here is quite longer. So here you're about uh, one and a half. Or maybe a little less than one and a half. And this one here you're almost two big blocks. And then all of the sudden, and this is characteristic of Wenckebach, you have a drop. So here is a, a P wave, and there's no QRS complex. So you have prolongation, progressive prolongation of the PR interval, and then a drop. And then it happens again. And oftentimes the drop is regular. So you have beat, 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 drop, beat, 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 drop beat, 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 drop, and so forth. And that PR interval is getting longer with each beat. And then after the drop, then it starts out uh, fairly normal again and then prolongs and so forth. That is Mobitz type 1 or Wenckebach, and that's a type of second degree AV block. So here's another one. You can see uh, this one, there's a drop every, looks like almost every other uh, uh, beat here. And then here's another one. So here you have four beats and then a drop. So notice the PR interval, it gets longer and longer and longer, and then you have a drop. Now, Mobitz type 2 is where you have a normal PR interval with intermittent drop beats. So look at this PR interval here. It is normal. This is less than one big block. And then all of a sudden, you have a drop. And here, actually, you have two drops. Here's your, your P wave, here's another P wave, and you have no corresponding QRS complex. So that is a second degree AV block, Mobitz type 2. So you have normal PR intervals, but intermittent dropped beats. So the, the AV node is not getting the signal to contract the ventricles. Remember, your P wave is contraction of the atria, your QRS wave corresponds to contraction of the ventricle. So you could zoom in here, make full screen, and you can see that your, your PR intervals are normal, but uh, you've got a, a, a regular dropped beat, a dropped ventricle, uh, or dropped ventricular contraction. So you, typically when you say beat, you're talking about a ventricular contraction. Uh, so, and, and these also tend to be fairly regular. And so your heartbeat will be irregular, but the, the dropped... Uh, QRS complex, the dropped heartbeat will be irregular, or will be regular, rather. Okay? So you can see uh, two, uh, two uh, ventricular contractions and then a drop, two ventricular contractions and then a drop, and then this looks like three, but in fact this is a different lead here. So that's different. Okay. So here's another Mobitz type 2. Again here you're seeing uh, normal PR intervals and then a dropped beat. 
Mobitz type 2, surprisingly, is actually more severe and can cause a heart attack. It's a failure of the his Purkinje cells. And this is in contrast to Mobitz type 1, which is reversible, and some patients are even asymptomatic. We'll go over the treatment when we review these. Now, this is a third degree AV block. There is no correlation between the P wave and the QRS complex. So here you see a P wave and a QRS complex, two big boxes in between that. Here you see a P wave and a QRS complex, less than one big box, that looks normal. Here you see a P wave and no QRS complex. Here you don't even see a P wave. Uh, here you see a P wave in one and three quarters, uh, or one and a half uh, boxes. So there's no rhyme or reason. That's the third degree AV block. There's no correlation between the P wave and the QRS complex. Okay, here's another one. So you're gonna have a very irregular heartbeat here. Whereas like the second degree Wankybach, you might have beat, 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 stop, beat, 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 stop. Third degree, you'd have beat, 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 beat. It's very irregular. So that's the third degree AV block. And this always requires treatment. A lot of these patients will be highly symptomatic. Okay, so just reviewing your AV nodal blocks here. First degree is merely PR prolongation, nothing else. So this is, because this is almost never symptomatic, you don't need to do any treatment for that. Second degree Mobitz type 1 or Wankybach is your progressive PR prolongation, which is then ultimately followed by a QRS drop. This is rarely symptomatic, so no treatment is required, but if there are symptoms, you can do IV atropine, and of course, it's if it's refractory, you can go on to pacing. Second degree Mobitz type 2, also known as HAY, H-A-Y, is a normal PR interval with sudden QRS drops. And this is occasionally symptomatic, and if it's refractory and it's causing the patient a lot of problems, you'll do internal pacing. And then third degree or complete AV nodal block is almost always symptomatic. In here, you have no association between your P wave and your QRS complex, and these patients will ultimately need internal pacing. All right, bundle branch blocks, our last topic. So bundle branch blocks are defects of the bundle branches. Surprise. So this is a block in the bundle of Hiss, and the bundle of Hiss is what comes down your interventricular septum and then kind of around the heart, and it's responsible for helping your ventricles contract. Now, as you can imagine, if this got really severe, you could have some major problems because your, your, your atria, you can kind of get away with them misbehaving. You, all, the, all of your atria need to do is get most of the blood down into the ventricles. But if the ventricles aren't pumping properly, then you've got some major problems because the ventricles get blood out to your body, they get blood to the lungs for oxygenation. So if you've got really severe problems here, you can be in some deep trouble. The good news is most bundle branch blocks aren't that severe. Uh, so bundle branch blocks are rarely symptomatic and it, they tend to be an incidental finding on EKG and there's a lot of things that can cause bundle branch blocks. What you'll probably be asked to do on the USMLE is distinguish a bundle branch block from right versus left. You'll need to know what a bundle branch block looks like, and then you'll need to know whether it's on the right or on the left. And you may also need to know that the most common cause of bundle branch blocks is ischemia and or a previous MI. So how do you tell if it's left or right? Well, it's fairly simple. You need to look at the precordial leads. Remember, your precordial leads are V1 through V6. And remember where they're placed. So here's your V1 here on the right side of the sternum, V2 on the left side of the sternum, and then they kind of wrap around, and then V6 is on the left side of the mid-axial line. So V1, V2, and V3 are really looking at the right side of the heart. V4 4, V5, and V6 are really looking at the right or the left side of the heart. So if you have bundle branch block on V1 through V4, and we're going to look at what a bundle branch block looks like, if it's, if it's noticed on V1 through V4, but not so much on V5 and V6, then it's on the right side. 
If it's noticed not so much on V1 and V2, but on V3, V4, V5, and V6, then it's on the left side. So a good way to do is look at V1 and V2. If you see it there, it's right. Look at V5 and V6, if you see it there, it's on the left. V3 and V4 can kind of be either or because it's right in the middle. So here's a good example of a right bundle branch block. So a bundle branch block will tend to look like a little dimple on your QRS complex. So look at your QRS complex here. V1 looks fairly normal. V, uh, V2, you see this little dimple right here. And then uh, V3 looks kind of normal. And then V4, V5, and V6 look totally normal. So this is a right bundle branch block. It's not the best example. Uh, but you see the, the dimple here that characterizes a bundle branch block is on V2, and that is going to be on the right side. Okay, so how about this one? So here, this one's a better uh, example here. You can see the dimple here is V2. You see another one, V3, uh, and then uh, v, uh, V4 looks good, uh, V5, and then V6 look good. So you really have to be careful here uh, and notice where V4 starts and where V1 ends. Uh, so this is where V4 starts. So V4, V5, and V6 all look normal, but you see the dimpling here on V2. Uh, it's quite an obvious dimple. See how it comes all the way down here? So this is a, a right bundle branch block. Okay, this uh, these aren't the best pictures. You can go on and uh, and look at some of the pictures on uh, Google Images if you just type in bundle branch block, it should show you. Uh, but here again, you see that dimple on uh, V2. Uh, V4, V5, and V6 all look good. So here's a left bundle branch block. You see that your QRS complex on V1, V2, and V3 look good, but here's that dimpling again here on V4. Here you see that little dimple on V5. V6 looks all right. So because this is happening more on the left side with V4 and V5, uh, that's a left bundle branch block. And then here is uh, another one here. You see the dimple on V6. You see it more pronounced on V5, not so much on V4, V3, and V2, and V1 look good. So what causes bundle branch blocks? Like I said, most commonly it's coronary artery disease and uh, previous MI, but with a right bundle branch block, it can be due to an atrial septal defect. It can be due to right ventricular hypertrophy. It can be due to a pulmonary embolism. It can be due to rheumatic heart disease, myocarditis. And then there's a genetic syndrome called Brugada syndrome, which you're not gonna be tested on on the USMLE. With left bundle branch block, it can be from aortic stenosis, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, aortic regurgitation, or Lyme disease. Now, what do these things have in common? A lot of these things have in common that they stretch out the ventricles. So when you stretch out the ventricles, you're going to stretch out the bundle branches, and that's going to make it more difficult for, uh, for, for the conduction to go down those branches. So anything that stretches out the ventricles can cause a bundle branch block. And then anything that directly damages the bundle branches, so like uh, having an MI or having coronary artery disease, that causes a bundle branch block. So that's some of your causes, but really for the USMLE, what you want to know is how to point these out. And it's gonna be that little dimple that you see on the QRS complex. And just remember, V1 through V3, it's gonna be right, V4 through V6 is going to be more to the left. Okay, and then here's another left bundle branch block. You can see the dimple here is right here on V4. It's just a very subtle one, and uh, it's hard to see V3. So it's mostly V4 here, so this is going to be left. 